Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. Atlanta's no, it's not. I'm sorry. I got a million things going all at once. I must be calm. And in the Zen-like state of this radio program, I just used the phrase Zen-like state. I might have the coronavirus. I will explain. The phone number here. <laughs> 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. We all need our laugh for the day. Uh, genuinely, this is this is way too funny uh, to not uh, talk about. The, the mayor of the city of Atlanta uh, released an advisory on the symptoms of coronavirus and and what you may or may not uh, pick up for coronavirus, and what you uh, should and should not be cautious about. And the advisory came from the World Health Organization, as best I can piece this together. The original advisory from the, the mayor of Atlanta, out to the city of Atlanta, came from this World Health Organization advisory, the World Health Organization advisory had originally been written in French. And in French, uh, yeah, one of the symptoms that you get in, in for the coronavirus, whether you're in France or otherwise, well, one of the symptoms you get is a white film in your mouth, particularly on your tongue. You can get this white film. And in French, the word tongue is langue, L-A-N-G-U-E. And so it is translated uh, a langue blanche, a, a, a white tongue. Well, the mayor of Atlanta has sent out the advisory. I've got a copy of it. I, I, I put it online. You can go see it. Find me on Twitter at E.W. Erickson or, or on Instagram at E.W. Erickson, and you can see it. One of the symptoms in the city of Atlanta, one of the symptoms of of the coronavirus is white language. <laughs> yes, white language, my friends. If, if you're in the city of Atlanta... And uh, you have a, a, a new say something like fiddly sticks or I'd like a soda. Uh, you, you may have coronavirus. You, you may have COVID-19. If you say hello there, you all, you, you may have COVID-19. <laughs> no, I wish I was making it up. Seriously. Um, the, the other thing is that the, in, in this graphic of the, of the symptoms, it also says avoid animals. And it has a picture of a snake on it, except the snake looks like, um, I don't want to use that word. Let's just say that this, the snake is, is white and has a squiggly tail. And so you, you use your imagination as to what it looks like. Avoid animals. Yes. Yes. Avoid that animal. You'll also avoid pregnancy if you avoid that animal. <laughs> Oh my god, y'all, no, seriously, it says, it says symptoms. Here are the symptoms for the coronavirus. Uh, a cough, uh, chest pain, chill, painful condition, diarrhea, sinusitis, fever, and white language. <laughs> I do declare, Miss Scarlet, I do feel under the weather. I do believe, because I am talking like Rhett Butler meets Foghorn Leghorn, I may have the coronavirus. <laughs> it was, now listen, what I find notable about all this is <laughs> the mayor of Atlanta, let, let me pull up, I saved the email. The, the, the mayor of Atlanta sent this out last week. And no one noticed how many people are reading the emails from the mayor of the city of Atlanta. That seems to be be a relevant question. I do declare that is a relevant question as I have here my soda. <laughs> yep, y'all, I'm sorry. You, you got to find humor somewhere. Yes, the... The mayor of Atlanta I wants you to know white language. Now, listen, listen, listen. There are people coming out. This is proof of racism in the mayor's office. That mayor is racist. No, no, no. It is a, when you see L-A-N-G-U-E, Blanche, you know that Blanche is white. Uh, Maison Blanche, that is White House. 
Um, but the, the adjective comes after the noun in, in French, typically. I, I took French for a number of years. Um, it, so Blanche comes after Maison. And uh, <laughs> um, it is not racism. It is a very bad translation from from the – and I suspect painful conditions. This is one of the other symptoms. According to this graphic from the mayor's office is painful conditions – and I, I really do suspect, or pay, I'm sorry, not plural, painful condition. I am, I'm, I'm fairly confident that likewise, the, the painful condition, given the, the way that the throat is highlighted in this graphic, uh, that it actually means a sore throat. You, you may have a sore throat, not a painful condition. You may have a sore throat, but the mayor's office <laughs> is out. Now, the reason I say that on painful condition is because it has a, a woman lying down and her throat area is highlighted in red. So I, I'm assuming it means you've got a sore throat, but in, it was trained translated from French, and there you have it officially from the mayor of Atlanta. If you say white people things, if you have white language, you may very well have coronavirus. Now, I know a lot of you are tired about this, and, and I, I want to I want to delve into this with a series of audio clips this morning uh, that make a point, but before I get to that point, I want to give you the real-world date on here, because when we left here on Friday... There were 361 cases of coronavirus in the United States. We now have 566 cases, and the death toll has gone up to 22. And uh, we have eight uh, recovered cases still. What I find very interesting here is that the recovered cases has stayed eight. Uh, since the beginning of last week, we had eight recovered cases, and we still have eight recovered cases. There has been no update on the recovered cases, either there hasn't been an update on recovered cases, or we just haven't had anybody uh, recover from coronavirus uh, as people keep dying. All the people who are dying it come mostly from Washington State. There's now been one in Florida and one in California. All the people dying are old, and I don't mean that in any sort of pejorative. It is 80-year-olds are dying, particularly in nursing homes. In fact, in Washington State, uh, this nursing home was understaffed to begin with and then underprepared to deal with the outbreak of the coronavirus there. Now, I want to play you some audio, and, and really, there is a point in me playing you this audio, and I'm just going to play a, a series of bits of audio without any commentary. I just want you to hear uh, everything that needs to be said Along the way, uh, we're going to begin with Rahm Emanuel on ABC News over the weekend. Here's the thing. Every crisis, overwhelming force on the front end. By the time. By the way, it's funny to hear him talk about crisis when he's the guy who said never let a crisis go to waste. Do it. If you wait three weeks, you've lost the initiative. This administration right now looks like they couldn't organize a one car parade. And I think here's what's going to be devastating for Donald Trump. Beyond the fact that this requires science, management, data and reassure, and being transparent, which are all his weaknesses, you're going to have a point within about two months where you cannot have big events together. If you look at presidential history, Franklin Roosevelt used to drive out in the country to get out. President Bush, 41, was on a speedboat. The Bush and Ronald Reagan would cut, obviously go to their ranches. He is not going to be able to have his rallies. And it is going to psychologically, the office is isolating enough and his inability to get the admiration, the adulation from that crowd is going to psychologically torment him. And his isolation is going to get more intense and his tweets are going to get more vicious. That's Rahm Emanuel. Here's Jackie Spear. She's the, the, the goofball congresswoman who believes that having an abortion is a safer medical procedure than getting your wisdom tooth out. I don't think the president is capable of telling us the truth about the coronavirus. And I regret saying that. I think we have to rely yes, on doesn't. the scientists who are attempting to tell the truth even when they have to contradict the president. The fact that he is not willing to cancel his... Uh, various rallies uh, suggests that he is willing to place even his most ardent supporters at risk because we're supposed to stay six feet away from other persons in order to mitigate uh, the exchange of those viruses. I, I'm sorry, that clip goes on, but I can't listen to her any longer. Here's Tom, uh, here's Anthony Fauci answering a question about being muzzled. Of infectious disease and outbreak is that you might get people to be complacent, number one. Um, number two, uh, when bad things happen, 
your credibility is lost because you've downplayed something. I think a lot of people are very interested in the relationship between the scientists and the administration. Right. And specifically, if President Trump says something like, at the beginning of February, like, we think we have it under control, you're in the room. Were you able to I talk push back, of course. Some people have been worried that you've been muzzled. I'm not muzzled because I'm talking to exactly. you. Exactly. You're right, right here. You, okay. <laughs> And let's see, here is Tom. Actually, no, I'm going to go to Brian Stetler next. What we need to do in this moment is prioritize accurate information from experts over misinformation from politicians. You know, Trump and the news media both have a tendency to make, well, everything about Trump, right? But this virus story is only a little bit about Trump. Should he be doing things differently? Yes. For example, the CDC says older Americans should limit travel. But he's not amplifying that message. He should be right now. In fact, he can tweet about it right now. The president should lead or else he should get out of the way. By all means, sir, please don't go out of your way to make a bad situation worse. Lead or get out of the way. Don't be an obstacle. Maybe just stay on the golf course. And one more, Chris Murphy. There's there's a method of my madness here. Just wait. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had really sharp words for the Chinese this week, and he said he basically put some blame on them for not sharing information earlier, and he indicated that is inhibiting the the response with the vaccine. Has, is that real? Is that what's affecting the U.S. response? Well, the Chinese early on were not sharing information, so that is correct. They have been much more forthcoming uh, since then. Um, but what is inhibiting our response in the United States is, in part, a president who is lying to the American people, who's telling them that a vaccine is a couple months away, who's telling everybody that they can get tested if they want. Um, if we really want to talk about what is going to potentially create panic in this country, it's an administration that's just not being straight with the American public about the extent of uh, this epidemic and the real-life consequences that could be uh, put upon Americans. Okay, so my point on this, this is this is the media commentary on coronavirus, what we're getting right now. We know that it is spreading, and we there's actually some indication that uh, there are people now, there's an outbreak in Southern California among people who should not have been, um, they, they should not have been, Infected because they did not, uh, they didn't come into contact with people who had been on the cruise lines. They didn't come into contact with people who had uh, been in the containment area. They didn't come into contact with healthcare professionals who had been looking at the people who were quarantined. And yet somehow they got it and they got mild cases of it. And so the data suggests it's actually been in the country longer than it had uh, originally been believed. And if that's the case, this is actually good news because the mortality rate turns out to be far less. And in fact, we're seeing from South Korea, where in South Korea, they are testing everyone. In South Korea, they're doing drive-through clinic testing in South Korea. 7,478 people have it. 53 have died. 118 total have recovered, uh, fully recovered. So 7,478 people have got it in South Korea, and they're doing drive-through clinic testing. They're testing everyone. Uh, and that is why we're getting th these explosive spread numbers in South Korea, because they're testing everyone. And we're not doing that in this country. And it now appears the virus has been here far longer than we otherwise thought. And in being here far longer than we are otherwise thought, it would bring the mortality rate down. All of this is to say the way the media is covering this is they're covering it as a not a health care situation, but as a political situation. They're allowing Democrats to come on television and pundits and, and anchors themselves like Brian Stetler. And they're attacking the president. They're blaming the president. They're suggesting that the president is to blame for the spread of the virus when now the ample data shows that the virus had been here a lot longer. They're downplaying that to upplay the president's visit to the CDC to mock it. They're allowing Democrats to come on to disparage the president and take shots at the president and claim that somehow a virus that is spread between people is the president's fault, that the president can't stop it. Now, the president has uh, hurt himself by going on Hannity and saying, if you have it, you can still go to work, which isn't true. The vice president had to come out and correct that. But by and large, the media is covering this as a political event. The media is covering this as political news. And now suddenly the polling suggests that Republicans are downplaying the 
con- uh, the coronavirus, and Democrats are upplaying it. That Democrats have gone into abject panic mode, and Republicans couldn't care less about it. And those are because the media itself has done a very good job of driving people into their partisan corners. Because the media itself, instead of bringing on the health care experts, have brought on the partisan Democrats to attack the president. And they bring on the Republicans to ask the tough questions of the Republicans in response to what the Democrats are saying. When the media is treating this as a partisan political event, you will have to forgive the American public for treating this as a partisan political event. And I don't think it helps the media to be lecturing the public that you're not as freaked out as you should be. Trump's in charge. Because all it does is it gets people into their tribal corners as opposed to looking at, okay, we have a virus. We know the mortality rate of this virus is higher than the flu. We know that if you're 80 years old and you get this, you're probably going to die. We know these things. And instead of just talking to people about the virus, we've got to let the talking heads come on and make it political. Not everything is political. A virus is not political. Okay. One of the things that is happening uh, in this situation now is that Mike Pompeo and other American politicians, uh, and not just Republicans, but Democrats as well, have begun referring to this virus as the Wuhan virus. Uh, Frankly, I I favor the Kung flu, and I I try to get my child at school to call it the Kung flu, and one of the teachers did not take too kindly to her calling it the Kung flu. And now most of I'm such a terrible parent, and now several of the kids in school are calling it the Kung flu. (laughs) But the... (laughs) The, the Wuhan virus, uh, the, the president's been calling it that, Mike Pompeo's now been calling it that, the vice president, a, a number of Democrats have been calling it that as well, uh, and the media is beside themselves that this is racist, uh, and, and this is spurring anti-Chinese stereotyping by calling it that, politicizing the virus, They the media accuses the White House as they bring on Democrats to attack the White House. Here's why, and you need to understand this fundamentally. The Chinese are now aggressively engaging in a PR campaign among the Chinese public to claim to the Chinese public that the United States has infected them. And I'm not making that up. I wish I was. The, the, the Chinese Communist Party on various news outlets in China has begun peddling a conspiracy theory that Western powers led by the United States contra- uh, concocted this uh, Wuhan virus in a lab and spread it in Wuhan. And so this is the Western powers, particularly in the United States, have been referring to it again as uh, the Wuhan virus to reiterate the fact that it came from China. It did not come from other other places. And you will not be surprised to learn that members of the media in the United States are freaking out about the racism of calling it the Wuhan virus. And how dare they perpetuate anti-Chinese stereotypes? You know, I got to say, uh, CNN has a story out today, Sanjay Gupta writing it. CNN, that CNN has begun to refer to this virus as a pandemic, which it is. It is a pandemic. Um, the definition of a pandemic, let me let me get you the, the actual definition. I'm going to definition of pandemic. The definition of pandemic is a, a disease prevalent to a whole country or to the world. That is the definition of of a pandemic, a pan, pan meaning global, dimic, pandemic. An epidemic is a a spread within a community uh, or a a large portion of a country. A pandemic is a worldwide spread. The World Health Organization is refusing to call uh, the the coronavirus a pandemic. Let me read you from 2010, a pandemic from the World Health Organization. A pandemic is the worldwide spread of a new disease. An influenza pandemic occurs when a new influenza virus emerges and spreads around the world, and most people do not have immunity. Viruses that have caused past pandemics typically originated from animal influenza viruses. Some aspects of influenza pandemics can appear similar to seasonal influenza, while other characteristics may be quite different. For example, seasonal and pandemic influenza can cause infections in all age groups and most cases will result in self-limited illness in which a person recovers fully without treatment. However, typical seasonal influenza causes most of its death among the elderly, while other severe cases are common in people all over. Uh, contrast with the H1N1 pandemic caused most of its fatal diseases in young people. Both seasonal and pandemic influenza, the total number of people who get the illness can vary. However, the impact of severity trends will be higher in pandemics. 
A pandemic is a worldwide spread of a new disease. That is definitionally what is happening with the coronavirus. But the World Health Organization is refusing to call it a pandemic because they do not want to anger China. That's it. They refuse to anger China, so they refuse to call it a pandemic. Uh, Kudos to CNN for calling it what it is. It is a global pandemic at this point. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425, as the voice said, and I need to prepare you for disaster um the the <laughs> the dow jones and oh, oh, oh we're already down 1884 points and the market's just opened the nasdaq down 588 and the s&p 500 down 208 uh apple is down 21 points already this morning facebook down 13 nike down six it it, it's oh it's it's bad out in the stock market today now why um because it's not just the um it, it is not just the stocks and the coronavirus panic uh saudi arabia has now decided to begin a war on oil prices oil prices are collapsing uh, as the futures market uh, the commodities futures market believe fewer people are going to be traveling uh, because of the coronavirus so that's going to in uh, offsets the demand and so that's going to lower the price and so saudi arabia has decided that it needs to do something And there's just not a whole lot that can be done at this moment. Um, Stock trading has halted uh, for 15 minutes after the Standard & Poor 500 cratered 7% already this morning. Um, this is the, these are not good things and, uh, we're going to be dealing with the fallout from this. Now, oil pl- prices have plunged after OPEC failed to strike a deal with its allies regarding production cuts and that caused Saudi Arabia to slash its prices as it reportedly gets set to ramp up production, leading to fears of a price war. Uh, West Texas crude and international benchmark Brent crude are tracking their worst day since 1991. Uh, which means uh, West Texas crude is now $9.15 a, a down, so it's trading at $32.13 a barrel. It's on pace for its second worst day on record. Uh, the international benchmark Brent crude is now down to thirty five fifty two a barrel, and it, it's going down even further. Saudi Arabia has announced massive discounts to its ofe- official selling prices for April. The nation is reportedly preparing to increase its production above 10 million barrels, the kingdom is pumping out 9.7 million, million barrels, has the capacity to ramp up to 12.5 million barrels a day, and uh, dun, 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 more supply and less demand equals what? Well, you don't have to be a, a total capitalist to understand the supply-demand curve, but it helps if you actually are know your basic economics and you are a capitalist. When you have increased supply and decreased demand, your price does what? It goes down. And because the prices are going down, you will benefit at the pump. You you actually will benefit at the point. Gas prices are falling. In fact, I saw in Georgia, uh, gas prices are, are hitting uh, lows right now, uh, five-year lows, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, when there aren't people traveling, people are, are changing their behavior, that's going to impact everybody, and people are upset with Saudi Arabia this morning, uh, as they probably should be. But now, nonetheless, uh, here, here's the thing. Uh, we've got the fear factor settling in, but there are two camps. A, a buddy of mine noticed this. He lives in New Jersey and commutes into New York City and does a lot of TV. And he noted that um, he noted that Going into New York, riding the train, no one's behavior has changed. No one's wearing masks. People are touching their faces. People are talking to strangers. People are sitting next to each other. Uh, it was only his only encounter with people refusing to shake hands or touch was on TV at MSNBC. At On TV at MSNBC, people were freaked out and didn't want to make contact and wanted to sit far away from each other, and no one else is doing that. Behavior is not actually changing in the public, and the media is trying to get everyone to change their behavior. Now, there are some signs that it's changing, and I'll tell you, again, one one more audio clip. This is from Ali Velshi, who, by the way, right now is noting that uh, 
trading has been halted across the board right now because of a 15% decline in the market, uh, which is pretty, pretty, pretty significant. Uh, but here's Ali Velshi uh, talking about us versus the rest of the world. That jobs number includes the person that's got their first job, their Lyft job, and their Uber job. That is correct. That's so why it's they, so low. And if the second two jobs get undercut by this, if they're not driving people, correct. if they're, right, that all of a sudden. How many Uber drivers you know for whom it's an extra job? Okay, and let me stop right there because this is worth noting. Uh, a number of these people, this became a phenomenon during the tr- Obama administration when the Obama administration rejiggered the jobs numbers so that if you have three part-time jobs and they equal 40 hours a week, you suddenly have one full-time job. And no one in the media wanted to point that out. And here at the beginning of this conversation on MSNBC, they're now pointing this out as if it's a bad thing when it was a good thing when Barack Obama was president. Right, that, because they've got of flexibility, them. right? So so, so that's everybody's got extra jobs. So, by the way, that's that's backward looking. So we'll see what happens in March. Yeah. But look at the number of people for whom the choice is not available. If you and I start coughing, feeling sick, we'll call in. One of us will do the other one's show. Yeah. We can figure that out. And we're employed and we're insured that's and we right. can go to a doctor. How many Americans don't have that option? They right. won't they won't even go to the doctor because they can't pay for it. They yep. get medication. They can't afford it. Yeah. And there's no one to call to tell them that, that they can't be sick. They don't have paid leave. So these are two basic things that the rest of the world has. Yeah. Universal health care. The rest of the developed world has universal health care and paid sick leave. We don't have that. Yeah. And, and as a result of that, people can't make economic choices. Initially, people... We don't have health care. We don't have universal health care. We don't have what the rest of the world has. And that's just terrible. This is the, the Democrats already... Uh, complaining and rumbling for health care agenda. I'm sorry, but even me, it makes me want to take this even less serious. It, it makes me want to take this uh, far more serious than what the Democrats would have us believe. And to see this complete meltdown of people rushing out to blame the administration for the spread of a virus that started in China that the Chinese refused to tell anyone about until after it started spreading in the wild is a little bit ridiculous to me. And I think most people get that. Everyone is looking through this at a a partisan lens, and it becomes very, very hard to get uh, straight answers. In a number of places around the country, you may be experiencing this in parts of North Atlanta, if you're listening in North Atlanta. Uh, In uh, local Costco's are sold out of groceries. You go to, well, for example, um, I was in my local Publix here in Macon yesterday. And all of the uh, the cleaning supplies were gone. Um, the the Lysol spray was gone. The the Lysol and Clorox bleach wipes were gone. The bleach was gone. Now we had toilet paper, but in a number of places around the country, the toilet paper is all gone. In my local Publix, I've been looking for two weeks for hand sanitizer and can't find it. And I've actually got to get the hand sanitizer, not because I'm freaked out about the coronavirus, because one, I keep one in my car all the time. And then two, uh, the kids need it to school and stuff. And it sold out. I was able to find three bottles at a CVS and, and was able to get the last three bottles there. But they're sold out. People are are clearly now doing to some degree what they need to do, which is stocking up on supplies, but other people doing what they shouldn't do, which is panic and hoarding. What is the difference? I actually got this question last week. Um, Helga, who was a child during World War II called and she says i'm i'm telling people not not to hoard uh, and not to stockpile but people need to be prepared what's the difference and i said well you know i i the difference is that if you go to the grocery store buy a few extra items every time you go of non-perishable food the, the canned goods the dry goods uh beans and pasta uh, canned goods and stuff you you can buy some of that and you'll be fine relax chill out What you don't want to do is go to the grocery store and stockpile in in such a way that you're buying so much food, it's never actually going to be eaten. You do not need a year's worth of food. Hell, you don't need a month's worth of food. Just get a few extra items if you had to minimize your contact with the outside world if this thing spread. Now, I I, I, I need to to talk to the contrarians for just a minute because there are a lot of contrarians who email me that, that even I am overstating and overblowing and causing people to panic and no one's going to get this and it's just the common cold. All right, let me give you some real world data. If we, if we, the, the, the rate of the flu deaths in this country based on the number of people who get it and die is a tenth of a percent. Now we do statistical sampling for the flu. And so we know there are way more people who get the flu than actually report. 
So when you add in the number of people who are probably getting the flu who aren't reporting, and you do that based on the the, the spikes in people buying over the counter uh, flu medications, things like that, uh, the mortality rate is basically a tenth of a percent. If you do that with the coronavirus that is spreading right now, the mortality rate is at a minimum uh, five tenths of a percent, so four tenths higher, which still isn't terrible, but is more likely slightly above one percent. Right now, globally, it's at three point seven percent. In the United States, it's at five percent, and the reason it's five percent in the United States is because we have limited reporting, and we have a, a large number of people in in Washington State in a nursing home who've died of it. And that throws off the numbers. The reality is it's probably about 1%, which is still really high. Now, you're thinking 1% of the American population, that's really not about you. That, that's actually, that could be, that's millions of people. Now, what is the actual reality here? We, we don't know. We, we do not know. We don't know the scenarios, but we do know historically these viruses, once they get into human populations from animal populations, they can mutate. And that mutation often goes against us. And because it goes against us, it increases the rate of mortality. You've got to remember the reason that everyone is panicked in the media, and they are panicked. Uh, There is a lot of panic there. You shouldn't panic. There are a lot of people panic. There are a lot of people trying to 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 make partisan points here. And and one of the things I, I, I feel obligated to do is to come on each day. And discuss with you, weed out the political stuff and weed out the panic stuff and give you bottom line stuff. But there's a lot of information out there that we don't know. There's a lot of information that has been revised and there's a lot of stuff out there that is wrong. I can't tell you the number of people who have told me uh, that hand sanitizer actually cannot prevent the coronavirus. In fact, I guarantee you there are people listening to me right now who believe that hand sanitizer cannot stop the coronavirus. And actually, that's wrong. We actually do know that hand sanitizer, well-applied hand sanitizer to your hands, actually stops the coronavirus. That is one of the handy things, one of our secret weapons against the coronavirus, is that a coronavirus, if you have 60% alcohol solution or higher in your hand sanitizer, it breaks down the cell walls of a coronavirus. And coronaviruses, Thus far in our experiences, whether it's SARS or MERS or, or uh, the, the, the swine flu, the bird flu, you name it, uh, they have never, these viruses have never been able to mutate in such a way to prevent hand sanitizer of 60% alcohol solution from breaking down the cell walls. There absolutely are viruses that hand sanitizer does not work against. The coronavirus is not one of them. So for all you people out there peddling the story that uh, hand sanitizer cannot stop this virus, you're actually sa- scientifically wrong. You are absolutely right that there are viruses hand sanitizer does not work against. You are wrong to say the coronavirus is one of those because, in fact, coronaviruses are notoriously easy to kill with 60% and higher alcohol solutions. It is one thing they can't seem to mutate against. They can mutate against a lot of stuff, but they haven't been able to mutate against that in our experience. Maybe this one will, but thus far, not, not so. There is a lot of stuff out there. There are a lot of people on the right who have gotten into contrary mode and say, well, it's just it, it's it's nothing more than the common cold. That's not true either. If left untreated and you don't take it seriously, it actually can be fatal more so than the common cold, more so than the flu. But realistically, the odds of you getting it are small. And there, there's another thing here that 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 I want to I, I, I feel obligated to point out because it's me saying this. And this may be your one takeaway for the entire day on this show. You know, in the early Roman Empire, uh, one of the things that that made Christians stand out so much is that when plagues would hit uh, the Roman Empire, particularly smallpox and and other things would hit the Roman Empire, uh, it was the Christians who would go into communities and take care of the population. And nowadays, so many of our Christian brothers and sisters uh, look so much like the rest of the world. They're in abject panic like everyone else, as opposed to going out and taking care of the poor and the needy and providing meals and preparing to take care of their congregations when they get sick and coming up with plans uh, in order to take care of their congregations. They're they're treating it just like everyone else. Uh, You've got to, if if you're part of a church community that believes God's on your side, you need to act like it when crisis comes. And a lot of people are just absolutely panicked by this. 
And, and yes, they are locking down Italy. Northern Italy is being locked down. Parts of China are locked down, and, and that suggests something scary. I don't know that this country has the willpower to do it. And frankly, there's something else. You know, I- impeachment was now 29 days ago, and we've moved on. By the summertime, I suspect the coronavirus is not going to be around. I suspect by summer this will no longer be an issue. What we spend inordinate amounts of time talking about now will not be an issue this summer. It will be something else. The odds are it will be the economy because of the ripple effect from the coronavirus will have an effect on the economy. Uh, But it will be something else. And by the time we get to November and the presidential election, it will be something else. And I do think that the media constantly focused on the idea that this is all the president's fault and whatnot. I suspect what we're going to see is that this turns around and blows up uh, in the media's face as they go after the president and try to make this political. Some things are not political. A virus is not political. The spread of a virus is not political. The president of the United States dealing with this virus is not really political. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropping this morning is not political. Uh, Scott Dworkin, who is a the co-founder of the Democratic Coalition, uh, r- r- ran out of the Obama administration, a uh, big believer in, in the resistance, allegedly helped fund the uh, whistleblower campaign against the president. He tweeted this, trade was halted at the New York Stock Exchange after it dropped almost 1,900 points this morning. Maybe if Trump didn't spend the weekend on vacation, it wouldn't have been so bad. Guess we'll never know. This is terrifying. Trump's a failure. Everything's got to be tied to the president on the left, and that makes the rest of us take this not very seriously. And frankly, that's a latent advantage to the president's campaign in 2020. You know, there's this interesting thread. Um, you see Gestetner, who is, um, oh, where does he, he's a, he works in marketing in New Jersey. Uh, he's a political commentator. Uh, let me just read you part of this. And, and I really do want to move on from coronavirus, but it kind of is in the news today. Uh, Friday, January 31st, 2020, a few weeks before coronavirus has officially spread to other countries, the Trump administration announced travel restrictions on China. According to the Politico on March 4th, 2020, quote, the Trump administration's quarantine and travel ban in response to the Wuhan coronavirus could undercut international efforts to fight the outbreak by antagonizing Chinese leaders. World Health Organization chief uh, said Tuesday that widespread travel bans and restrictions weren't needed to stop the outbreak. On February 2nd, the Trump administration ordered U.S. travelers to China's Hubei province to be held in mandatory quarantine for two weeks. Uh, Politico quoted health experts saying this would make it worse because people would hide their symptoms. On February 4th, a Politico article by Alice Onstein quoted Democratic Representative Barra fully opposing the steps the president had taken. At the end of the article, Politico finally had a few quotes backing the Trump administration. The lead now at Politico is uh, the Trump administration's mismanagement helped fuel the coronavirus. All of this stuff goes to show how the media looks at this through a partisan lens, and that partisan lens is designed explicitly to hurt the Trump administration. It is designed explicitly to to blow up the Trump administration. Um, here, here's, here's the funny thing. Uh, so this is Dan Diamond at Politico. Yes, in late January, Trump's initial coronavirus moves were widely hailed as strong and appropriate response. In the last five weeks, officials' own frustration has grown. And yet here's, here's the story from Politico. Uh, corona quarant- coronavirus quarantine travel ban could backfire, experts say. So the Trump administration did a global quarantine on travel to China and, and forcing Americans into quarantine back in January, World Health Organization officials said this is bad. This could stop us from being able to stop the coronavirus. And now the coronavirus has spread despite those things. And now they're telling us that the Trump administration didn't do enough to stop the coronavirus. He can't win for losing. I'm putting this out on Twitter, uh, this uh, thread from from Yossi, so you can see these headlines. You can follow me on E.W. Erickson, uh, and you can see this thread where he documents the headlines going back to January, where the media is attacking the president for doing too much to stop coronavirus, and now they're attacking the president for not having done enough. The man can't win for losing. The man can't lose for winning. 
The man just can't catch a break. The market's down. It's got to be his fault. If the market goes up, it's not his fault. If unemployment is good, it's Barack Obama's credit. If it's bad, it's Donald Trump's fault. And these aren't Democrats doing this. This is members of the media. Now, I realize many of you say, well, they are Democrats. Yes and no. Um, a lot of Americans still look at them as, as some sort of objective mouthpieces, and they shouldn't be, and this is all problematic. And again, if you're just tuning in here, I spent the first 15 minutes of this program playing a lot of the audio from the Sunday shows. Uh, and what it was is the media bringing on Democrats and allowing them free pass to attack the Trump administration over pretty much everything related to coronavirus. And when they do that, it's very hard for the American public to take this virus seriously. It should be taken seriously. It has the potential to seriously impact the United States. It is objectively impacting the economy. Market trading has been suspended as a result of a crash over market freakouts over Italy quarantining its population and the spread of it in the United States and the impact it's having on the world and possibly a recession and everything else. And the underlying fundamentals of this economy, interestingly enough, at the end of February were, were actually good. Chris Burns was on earlier, uh, earlier or last week, pointing out that you know the jobs market was really, really good in February. Uh, unemployment at an all-time low, three point five percent, is remarkable how well the economy was doing until the coronavirus hit. And you know, not everybody can work from home. Plumbers, electricians, and stuff they can't work from home. And this nonsense from the media that we all can isn't a good narrative. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show across the state of Georgia and beyond now. The phone number 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. I, I continue to be shocked at the number of people who believe the president cut funding for the CDC. He certainly proposed it. But he did not actually um, he, he did not actually get it cut. Um, we need to, uh, let's see, who is Raheem Kassam, editor of the National Pulse, War Room 2020 podcast, Uh uh-oh, um, saying that he's got symptoms of coronavirus. So if you're just tuning in, welcome. Let let me, let me bring you up to speed here. I don't want to, I don't want to spend a bunch of time on coronavirus. I did last hour, but it actually is kind of big news today. Uh, Ted Cruz is uh, self-quarantining because he was at CPAC. CPAC is the Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, which is, it's just a, pay-to-play conference in Washington, D.C., where a bunch of Republicans and others can go pay money, get on stage, and have their idea dubbed conservative. Interestingly enough, after the resurgent conference I did this past year, they shook up their format, and now everybody's having conversations on stage as opposed to just giving speeches on stage. Hmm, I wonder where they got that idea from. Uh, it works, but nobody got the coronavirus at the resurgent gathering. Now, at CPAC, someone did and came into contact with the president, came into contact with Ted Cruz, among others. So Cruz is self-quarantining. Here's CNN. Tonight, Texas Senator Ted Cruz said he will self-quarantine after interacting with an individual at the Conservative Political Action Conference who later t- tested positive for the novel coronavirus. Now, Senator Cruz writes in a statement, quote, I'm not experiencing any symptoms and I feel fine and healthy, given that the interaction was 10 days ago and that the average incubation period is five to six days, that the interaction was for less than a minute, and that I have no current symptoms. The medical authorities have advised me that the odds of transmission from the other individual to me were extremely low. Yep, uh, and and that's that's essentially what's going on here. Um, and, and let me let me give you one more bit of update before we move on. This uh, there are two pieces you should hear from the Surgeon General and from Anthony Fauci, and I want you to hear from them because they're the experts and and not from me relaying. You should hear it from them themselves. Here's the Surgeon General. We've got new data emerging. We know that the average age of people who are dying from coronavirus is 80 plus. We know that the average age of people who are needing medical care and advanced medical care is 60 plus. And so what we're telling folks is that if you're in an at-risk group, meaning you're elderly and or you have comorbidities, heart disease, lung disease, you're immunosuppressed for whatever reason, that you should be taking extra precautions not to put yourself in a situation where you may be exposed. What if you're pregnant? Uh, Again, if you're pregnant, I would advise taking extra precautions. But that said, no one under the age of 30 has died of the coronavirus in, uh, in South Korea. No one under the age of 50 has died of coronavirus in Japan. There's something about being younger that is protective, 
But if you are in one of those higher risk groups, we suggest you avoid crowded spaces. We suggest you avoid uh, potentially going on a cruise or taking a long haul flight because uh, most people are going to be fine. But we want those folks who we know are at higher risk for complications to protect themselves. And Anthony Fauci. Can anybody who needs a test get a test now? The fact is the tests are out there. There was a misstep early on with regard to the test, namely a, a technical difficulty. But right now, about 1.1 million tests are out there now. There'll be an additional about 640,000 on, let's say, Monday, and then at least another 4 million, particularly now that we're engaging the private sector. Now, when you say that, they're out there. If you go to a doctor, it's up to the doctor to order the test. And if that happens, a person should have a test available. But it's no doubt, Chris, you have to be realistic. Early on, there were some missteps that delayed it. I, but wanna, I, think I, wanna, I wanna pick up on that, doctor, uh, and, and the question of testing. I wanna put some numbers on the screen. As of Thursday, the CDC had tested only 1,583 people. In California, only 516 tests. Meanwhile, in South Korea, more than 60 66,000 people were tested within a week of the first case of community transmission, and they can now test 10,000 people a day. Why are we so far behind? You know, I think, I mean, it gets back to what I said in the beginning, that the, the CDC made a test. There was a technical glitch there. The CDC provides tests for the public health uh, uh, groups in the state and local. What we really need to do now, which were the numbers that I mentioned to you, is to get the private sector involved so that you could literally flood it with millions and millions of tests. That is happening now, but in fact, the American people need to realize that in the beginning there was a glitch, and we need to overcome that now. And the glitch has been overcome. And, and again, the, the key point here that Chris Wallace raises is in South Korea, they've tested a ton more people than us, and that's why their number is so much higher than us. And the odds are that this, this virus is out in the wild in the United States and has been. And there is now evidence of that in Southern California where individuals have tested positive for the disease. And uh, they have not come into contact with people or traveled to Italy or things like that. Uh, you should know uh, that it appears that the false positive in Floyd County, Georgia, was in fact a false positive. In fact, I'm looking at the um, the Johns Hopkins University dashboard site right now uh, for the United States and where individuals are around the world infected and in the United States. We have 566 cases, and in Georgia, the one in Floyd County was on the map and is now not on the map. Uh, what is on the map is we've got one in Polk County, one in Cherokee County, three in Cobb County, and four in Fulton County. Now, the one in Polk County may have been the Floyd one, uh, but I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know for sure that that's the case. But Polk County... Uh, Cherokee County, Cobb County, and Fulton County. So we've got seven, eight, nine cases in the state of Georgia. There are all sorts of rumors as well. Man, the number of people I, I hear saying, oh, we've got one at our hospital and no one's allowed to say. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that in Macon. I heard that in church the other day. So-and-so said that they heard from so-and-so that there's one at this particular hospital in, in isolation and that all the doctors and nurses have been told not to say anything about it. That's not true. And I know you're hearing it, but that's not true. Um, and, and there's no reason to, to gossip and, and spread rumors and, and cause people to panic. Now, can we move on to other stuff? I want to talk briefly about the Leffler Collins race. Uh, there was a, and before I get there though, um, if you're the praying type, you should be praying for John Graves. John Graves is Congressman Tom Graves' son. Uh, yesterday morning, John, his son, he's a member of Georgia Tech cycling team. He was critically injured uh, in Calhoun at the downtown Criterium. He was airlifted to a trauma unit. He's in intensive care. He's showing signs of responsiveness, um, but he was was critically injured. Uh, so if you're the praying type, put John Graves on your prayer list, please. That's Congressman Tom Graves' son. Now, on this Leffler Collins race, uh, on Friday, the president went to Atlanta. I was on radio for seven hours on Friday. The president went to Atlanta 
and uh, tied up traffic in the afternoon and went to the CDC and the Democrats are mocking his appearance and saying it was unserious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, something happened on the side. Uh, who should get off Air Force One with President Trump but Kelly Loeffler? She flew with the president to Nashville from Washington, she and David Perdue. They toured the damage in Nashville, Tennessee, where more people have died than have died of the coronavirus in the United States. And hold that thought. We're going to get there. And then they they got back on Air Force One and they flew to Atlanta and got off in Atlanta, where on the ground they met Congressman Doug Collins and multiple reporters from multiple outlets said it was a very awkward encounter. So apparently, uh, Kelly Leffler reached out her hand to shake Doug Collins' hand uh, as if he was her long-lost best friend, and Collins gave her a very perfunctory uh, shaking of hands and otherwise had his arms crossed. And then they went to the CDC, and there are several pictures that have come out, and Leffler's glad-handing with everyone and talking to David Perdue and looking happy, and Collins looks miserable. I mean, he really did in the pictures. Even several of uh, Doug Collins' friends sent me that picture and said, ouch, doesn't look good. Um, and then also when they landed at Dobbins Air Force Base, uh, Kelly Leffler, David Perdue got in the beast, the president's limo, uh, and drove off with him. And Doug Collins was pushed into the press van with members of the press uh, and was didn't seem to be happy about that either. Now, a lot of people have been heralding this as some sort of insult. And along the way, uh, have been pointing out that uh, this was a snub to Doug Collins by President Trump. I want to set the record straight on Doug Collins' behalf, please. The reason that Doug Collins did not fly on Air Force One to Atlanta was not that the president snubbed him, as some people are reporting. What actually happened is that Doug Collins uh, was told that the troop was canceled, and it was. Uh, And because it was canceled, Doug Collins got on the first available Delta flight. There's a Delta flight every hour on the hour in Washington to Atlanta and from Atlanta to Washington. It's very easy to get back and forth. Collins got on the flight from Washington, came back to Atlanta. And if you will recall, the president had diverted to Nashville and wasn't coming to Atlanta in large part because someone at, at the CDC had tested positive for coronavirus. Turns out that was a misreport and was wrong. So Collins, uh, the trip was back on. So Collins scrambled to get up to Dobbins to be able to be on the tarmac when Air Force One landed. That's why he wasn't on Air Force One. There was no snub. The flight got canceled. Leffler stayed behind in Washington with David Perdue because there was Senate business to attend to and there was no House business. So Collins got on a plane and came home and only then when the flight was on. Now, because of that, Leffler and Perdue got to be in um, in the, the beast of the presidential limo and Collins did not because spacing was made available to them. Now, it is fair to say, though, and I talked to a friend of mine at the White House who confirmed all of this. And the friend of the White House says there was no slight intended to Doug uh, Collins by not having him on Air Force One. That if you want the sense of the slight, if you if you will, if you want the sense of where the president's thinking is on this race, pay no attention to that. Pay no pay attention to what happened next. What happened next is way more important than what happened to begin with. What happened next is. Kelly Leffler went back to Dobbins Air Force Base with the president, joined her husband. They got on Air Force One and they flew to Florida to a Trump victory event where President Trump hung out with his top donors. And with those top donors, introduced Kelly Leffler and her husband as his special guests. So the president put Kelly Leffler and her husband in a room full of the president's top donors and did not do that to Doug Collins. And again, I talked to a a credible high-level source at the White House who tells me there was no slight intended by the president not having Doug Collins on Air Force One coming to Atlanta. But uh, he... There was, you should interpret, according, again, high-ranking, credible White House source told me, you should read into the tea leaves that it was Kelly Leffler on Air Force One going to Florida uh, and not Doug Collins. That kind of is a big event. The president, I am told, again, reliably from people in the White House, 
was a little bit miffed that Doug Collins did not want to go to the uh, DNI job, the director of national intelligence. The president wanted him there. The president thought he had a solution to avoid a nasty fight in Georgia. Collins did not take him up on that, and that is Collins' responsibility, not Leffler's responsibility. This person in the White House tells me that in their view, Leffler has played her cards thus far very well. And while the president has not publicly endorsed her, the fact that he's taken her to hang out with his donors could be seen as a tacit endorsement. Holy cow. Um, this is a tweet from CNN January 20th. I, I wanted to not talk about I'm so tired of the conversation. I'm so tired of the topic. But there's just so much news. And, and my, oh, man, Max von Sydow has died um, at age 90. That's sad. Uh, what a great actor. Um, just seeing that, uh, Max von Sydow, uh, dead at 90 gracious. Um, okay. I, I promise I, I've got so much other stuff I want to talk about, a- including, you know, the, the tax commissioner up in Fanning County, up in Blue Ridge has been arrested by the GBI. Uh, we'll get there, but I just, I, I see this stuff. I, you know, I, I, I do these in, in real time and this show it's hard to run the show in delay and my apologies to those of you in south georgia there are a couple stations that run it in delay um this but this is timely so here here we go uh this is a tweet from cnn january 23rd of all the aspects of the rapidly spreading wuhan virus this is perhaps the most alarming a single patient has infected 14 healthcare workers that's what's called a super spreader that is a tweet uh that is called uh, this is a tweet from CNN. Um, also, there's this. Let, let me play you this from Town Hall Media. Let me see if I can rearrange my, my mixer here to, to play this for you so you get this. At least six people have died from the Wuhan coronavirus. The Wuhan coronavirus has now surpassed the 2003 SARS outbreak and the number of lives it's claimed. They're under quarantine out of concern that passengers and crew were exposed to the Wuhan coronavirus. And this breaking news just into CNN, the official death toll from the Wuhan coronavirus in China's Hubei province has now risen to 780. Now, I, I don't need to go on from there, but even Democratic politicians and whatnot are calling it the Wuhan coronavirus or the Wuhan virus. So here comes David Gura. David Gura is a reporter for NBC. And he is now declaring that if you call the virus the Wuhan virus, you are racist. Uh, is it any wonder that no one uh, takes the media seriously? Is it any wonder that uh, the media is its own worst enemy when it comes to this sort of stuff? Uh, the idea that calling this virus, uh, the Wuhan virus, makes it racist is absolute uh, nonsense. Uh, you're, you're an idiot if you think that's the case. And yet here is a reporter who seems to think that's the case. Uh, My goodness gracious. Um, These people are so annoying. Okay, let me get into this. Uh, Let me get into this. Uh, David Clement is joining me at the bottom of the hour uh, from Students for Liberty. want to talk to him about his group because I keep getting hearing from a lot of you that you you got college age kids. You want to get them involved in in groups on campus, but there are a lot of grifter groups out there right now. Uh, Some of them very prominent. We don't need to name names, but I'm actually a big fan of Students for Liberty and and want to talk to him about their upcoming conference. Um, But the Fanning County Tax Commissioner has been arrested uh, after an investigation into forgery. Shirley Sosabi, 63 of Blue Ridge, was charged with forgery and violation of oath by a public officer. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation was requested by the Fanning County Sheriff's Office to assist in the investigation. The Sheriff's Office received a complaint that Sosabi forged someone's signature on a deed of transfer title in an effort to obtain the Fanning County property for use by her family. She was booked into the Fanning County Detention Center on a $10,000 bond, forging a deed of transfer so her family could uh, could could take use of property. Wow. That's dirty. My goodness gracious. 63 years old. Now, she could hire David Ralston and keep this thing from ever going to court if she wanted. 
<laughs> the jokes write themselves. Also, look, we got to get into this story um, it, when we come back. There actually is another Georgia story we need to talk about uh, involving Jenny Earhart. Jenny Earhart, uh, Earl Earhart, was a prominent member of the State House of Representatives, has retired. His wife is taking his seat. She is introducing legislation into the House of Representatives that would ban health care professionals from performing transgender surgeries on children. The bill specifies criminal penalties for medical professionals who perform surgeries, such as mastectomies, uh, vaginoplasties, castration, penectomies, etc., for the purpose of attempting to affirm the minor's perception of the minor sex, if that perception is inconsistent with such minor sex. The bill would also ban the administering of medications such as puberty blockers or hormones to children for the same purpose. Now, interestingly enough, I hear there may be bipartisan support for this legislation. This comes on the heels of a number of reports of doctors performing surgeries on children still going through puberty to prevent those children from fully developing uh, as God intended them. And this is picking up some steam in the state legislature, and uh, I'm hearing this may actually be the surprise piece of legislation to advance. Uh, There's actually, this is legislation uh, that's getting bipartisan support around the country, actually, in a number of states. Uh, And and people look at it as, no, it's it's crazy right-wingers doing this. Actually, no, Uh, there is growing concern even among some Democrats that in the rush to affirm the transgender agenda, that uh, doctors are moving very quickly to allow young people who who haven't even gone through puberty and experienced full hormone development to start mutilating their bodies to conform to something. And there are multiple cases from Europe that's been doing this for a while, particularly in Great Britain, where a lot of patients are coming forward and saying, hey, uh, you know, I thought I was a boy, but I really am a girl. And why did you let me do this when I was 13? Uh, There's one her tragic story that's come out in Great Britain about that. We'll get into that. But when we come back, uh, we need to have a conversation with David Clement first. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show, all over the place now. The phone number, if you want to call in, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Joining me right now from the Students for Liberty, a fantastic organization, is David Clement. David, thanks very much for being on the program with me. Thank you very much for having me. So now you guys have a conference coming up, don't you? We sure do. Yes, we have uh, Liberty Con coming up in 25 days, the the first weekend of April. And where's it going to be? It is in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's April 3rd to 5th, and we uh, we host the event at the Marriott Marquis in D.C. Now, and you guys aren't planning on canceling it over the, the coronavirus concern? <laughs> no, no, we've gotten lots of questions about it. As of right now, the conference is still uh, slated to... To go ahead, obviously, we'll take some extra precautions in terms of um, sanitation and whatnot. But yeah, right, as of right now, the conference is still set to proceed, proceed as planned. Fantastic. So, it, you know, I, I talk up because I get questions a lot of times from people. In fact, I got some last week from a parent whose kid is, is headed off to college and mm-hmm. wants to wants to know what groups to get involved with. And, you know, there's the usual there. There's um, Young America Foundation. There's there's the mm-hmm. college Republicans. And I keep telling people they need to look into Students for Liberty as well, as opposed to some of the other groups that are out there. And, and uh, if you could just give people a, a bit of history about Students for Liberty. Yeah, so SFL was an organization that was founded uh, over a decade ago, um, very much in the wake of kind of the, the the first Ron Paul moment. And at the time, the founders of the organization decided it would be best to create an organization where students could come together on campus, talk about pro-liberty ideas, talk about the best practices for spreading these ideas through campus, because as you know, um, College campuses in the United States and abroad don't aren't necessarily the most uh, receptive environments for for pro liberty ideas. And over the last ten years, the organization has grown from a handful of people to over three thousand trained student leaders around the world. Uh, we have activism currently going on in all inhabited continents, um, and so we have really seen this tremendous growth over the last. Uh, 10, 12 years. And what that means is we have students who are committed to the ideas for 
of the United States, of the Constitution, of limited government, of individual responsibility, uh, hosting events, and advocating for these ideas on campus. And so uh, we find that more often than not, we are a very welcome voice for those who are looking um, for an avenue to get involved, for those who are passionate about uh, political ideas and having those debates and free speech and open discussion, uh, SFL is certainly a home for, for those college students. Now, you know, you mentioned this tying into the Ron Paul movement when it first got started, mm-hmm. and there is a growing divide, I think, on the right these days between kind of libertarian ideas, um, yep. uh, just the leave us alone conservatives, and now there's this growing sentiment of uh, let, let's have the big nanny state but use it for conservative ends. Uh, where do mm-hmm. you and where do students' liberty kind of fall down and fall, fall in on that debate? We certainly fall on the libertarian side of that debate. So uh, our students are very active in regards to um, pushing back against things like the nanny state. One quite funny example I can think of is a group of our students. uh, This was a few years ago. Michael Bloomberg was uh, their keynote uh, speaker at convocation. And our students, as a kind of funny way of protesting, all showed up with their extra large big gulps. Um, and engaged with the media on why they were bringing their big gulps to convocation to kind of poke fun at Michael Bloomberg's <laughs> nanny statism. Um, so we, we have students who definitely push back against the nanny state, um, and they thoroughly ado- enjoy doing that and do it in creative ways that I could never even imagine coming up with. <laughs> Okay, that that's that is that's fantastic. Now, um, it, it, with this growth on on college campuses of mm-hmm. um, it, it, a lot of a lot more intellectual thought now, particularly as I'm finding myself and and feel free to to tell me if you disagree, uh, mm-hmm. but I'm finding that as colleges seem to be cracking down almost on conservative speech around the country, there is this this growth and desire among conservatives on campus to hear more uh, mm-hmm. and, and to to think more about it and to engage at an intellectual level. And a lot of times, you know, back when I was in college, we had Young America's Foundation and the like, and they would bring in intellectual speakers. And and more and more, there seems to be a lot of red meat that's thrown in some of these groups, as opposed to actually getting into the heart of what it means to be about liberty and and Mm -hmm. actually engaging at that level. What what do you guys do to try to engage the, the intellectual underpinnings of the liberty movement? Yeah, so what we do is we very much focus on the ideas. We are not the 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 type of organization who's hosting uh, politicians on college campuses to give their kind of stump speech and then disappear into the wind. Um, We really focus on the ideas. And a perfect example of that is a film screening and Q&A campaign that we've recently just concluded with Steve Forbes talking about the importance of sound money, um, which sounds like a very nerdy uh, intellectual topic and can be maybe intimidating for some, uh, but our students have had the ability to have someone like Steve Forbes on campus or virtually um, talk through the importance of sound money, talk through monetary and fiscal policy, the role of the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve and things like that uh, on college campuses. And uh, not to our surprise, but maybe to the surprise of others, the response has been overwhelming. And so we're seeing students who aren't necessarily interested in those rah-rah, uh, this is what we're going to do going into the next election type of event or speech. They're really looking to build their own perspective, build their knowledge base, and build their uh, ability to defend the ideas of liberty. And I think it's important to focus on the ideas for that, because if you don't, you're not going to make a very good advocate. And so that's what we really hammer home with our students, is the importance of obviously making the case for liberty, but being able to do it well in a way that brings other people in rather than forces them out. Okay, I, look, I, I'm, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, David, and, and I'm going to mm-hmm. say this with you listening to me. Uh, this is one of these precise reasons why I like Students for Liberty over some of these other groups that have cropped up on campus, is what you just heard David say is he, he, they're engaging in an intellectual ideas level so that people understand why the ideas are good, as opposed to some of these groups that have st- started, some of them, interestingly enough, with some diehard Trump critics uh, who are now some of the president 
president's biggest supporters running mm-hmm. around on campuses saying all these things where, where the ideas of the conservative movement are about owning the left and, and voting for the president, as opposed to an intellectual foundation for why you actually are uh, someone who supports liberty, someone who supports the ideas of freedom. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you all day long that, that this is why I like Students for Liberty as opposed to some of these other groups. But David, I, I, you just articulated that so well. It's it's a real frustration of mine uh, to go to college campuses now, and, and everybody just expects a, a red meat speech as opposed to why do we believe what we believe. Exactly, exactly. And really, if you care about the ideas of free markets and you care about the ideas of individual liberty and limited government, your goal should not be owning the libs at any expense. Your goal should be how do we make more people open or how do we expose more people to these ideas? And that's really why we bring LibertyCon together as an event. It's, it's our marquee opportunity to showcase exactly that and to have the event be an expose on what it looks like to have a variety of different ideas on display, have debates on important subjects, host people from across the political spectrum talking about where they agree, where they disagree. And so, yeah, it's a fundamentally different approach than some of those other um, organizations on, on college campuses. Okay, if people want to find out more information, where do they go? LibertyCon.com. Uh, you'll get all the registration and speaker information. Uh, we have some world-class marquee content for, for the event. I encourage everyone to, uh, to register and attend. David Clement from uh, Students for Liberty, thank you so much for coming on, and, and good luck with the conference, and, and good luck actually uh, in this age of media fear over this virus, uh, being able to withstand the storm. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. David Clement, Students for Liberty. Uh, go to libertycon.com. Seriously, y'all, uh, I am, I, I'm really frustrated. A friend of mine uh, reached out to me and said, w- would you get David on to talk about this conference? And yes, because I do on a weekly basis. I'm 44. My kids are 11. 11 and 14. We don't have to worry about this for a while, but I know a lot of listeners of the show are in their their 50s and older and have kids on college campuses, and they're trying to get them plugged in and to think about life and to form their worldview, and and there aren't a lot of places on a lot of college campuses. You know, I was at Mercer uh, University in Macon and started the College Republicans there back in the mid-90s, and there really weren't any groups on campus at Mercer engaging intellectually left or right. And now there are several. Uh, you go to UGA, you go to Georgia Tech, you, you find way more comfort talking about ideas from a left of center perspective than you do a, a right of center perspective. I, I spoke at UGA last Wednesday. It was in the middle of midterms, had a great group of college Republicans turn out and, and just trying to engage them. And the point I made to them is kind of the point that David and, and Students for Liberty make is ideas still matter. I know the left does not believe it, but a day will come when Donald Trump is no longer president of the United States. And it may come in January of next year, depending on the election in November. And if it doesn't come in January of next year, it absolutely will come in January of 2025. Now, there are people like Bill Maher from Real Time on HBO uh, who is convinced, dogmatically convinced, the president will never leave the White House. The president takes advantage of this sort of stuff by running these trolling memes on Twitter that show him as president forever. I mean, it incites blind rage from people. There's a particular video that shows uh, re-elect Trump 2020, and then it fast forwards and the sign becomes re-elect Trump 2024, and then 2028, and then, uh, what, 2032, and then <laughs> on and on it goes. And people fly into a blind rage over it. Y'all? The president's time will come. The president's time will come and he will no longer be there. What will remain are ideas. And if your idea is to own the left, that's not an idea. Because there's no such thing as a permanent political majority in the United States of America. Ideas come and people and politics come and go. It is a it is a huge huge thing uh, that we on the right have forgotten how to articulate and advance our ideas because it has become all about uh, owning the left with President Trump and inciting the left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ideas matter, y'all. Ideas genuinely matter. And because ideas matter, we need to support groups on college campuses that that support those ideas. For example. 
There is a famous young, and I'm not going to go into names, no, I'm not, but there is a very famous young person right now who's making waves on college campuses with a, uh, with a purportedly conservative group and has convinced a bunch of donors to give a bunch of money to keep this group going, and in 2012 was a huge Mitt Romney supporter. And now is getting on stages around the country attacking Mitt Romney. How could anyone trust Mitt Romney? And and this person was a huge Donald Trump critic during the primaries, huge Donald Trump critic. And now suddenly wants to hump the president's leg. It's the most bizarre thing to see. No intellectual integrity or honesty there at all. And it's all about owning the left. And let's get people riled up and have a good time. And listen, I'm all about having parties on college campuses. I, 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 I like to go to, I used to, I'm too old for it now. I'd be the creepy old guy. Hello, fellow children. But back then, I mean, but still, it's insane to see some of these groups. They come on college campus and they just want to throw red meat to the crowd. Uh, Let's throw red meat. You know, honestly, I, I know people in talk radio these days, uh, Not not, and I'm not talking about national shows. Don't hear me attacking any of my friends at the national level. But but uh, people at the regional or the state level in talk shows around the country who would love to have national shows. I would love to have a national show, too. I would love to be a national syndication. But they think the method to doing it is where we are these days in the cultural zeitgeist of the right is to just put chum in the water, throw red meat to the crowd, and, yeah, we're going to own the left. Yeah, did you know Barack Obama really? was a Muslim. Yeah, I mean, it's just all this this nonsensical BS to own the left, to incite the left, to drive them crazy. And it's all because Donald Trump is president of the United States, and that's what Donald Trump does on stage. And so everyone wants to do the poor man's version of Donald Trump. They're either doing a poor man's version of Rush Limbaugh, they're doing a poor man's version of Donald Trump, and they're not actually being themselves, they're actually playing a character. And you can only play that character for so long before your show ultimately gets canceled. You can't cancel a real person, but you can certainly cancel a character. And so many of these people and so many of these groups, they're just throwing red meat out. They're getting college kids riled up. It's all about reelecting the president. The president is not forever. The president will go. The ideas will stay. And no one wants to engage the ideas anymore. Why is low taxation good? Why is large federal debt bad? Why is the growth of the federal government bad? Why is the individual good? Why we should be devolving power to the states and local communities instead of holding in Washington, D.C.? All of these things we should be talking about. School choice we should be talking about. Uh, The School choice should be the civil rights issue of the era, and it should be led by Republicans. But instead, it's all about owning the left. That's why I like groups like Students for Liberty that actually engage at the intellectual level that, my goodness, you're, you're going to show up and these kids are all reading Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, Understanding Basic Economics, as opposed to let's just throw chum in the water. The people who are doing that, listen, I could be far more successful right now and make a lot more money if I were throwing chum in the water and stirring the pot and owning the left and rah rah and everything the president does and and, and being willing to play uh, tackle and block on everything the president does, and it would all be fake. It would not be me. It would be me doing a character, a caricature of someone on the right, and I'm not going to do that. And, and if it costs me ratings, it costs me money, it costs me fans, that's fine. But I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not just to stir the pot and, and and get all sorts of buzz. Oh, can you believe the audacious thing Erickson said today? No. I mean, my job is to entertain you. It, it certainly is to keep you company wherever you are, but it's also to inform you. But more than that, I really take seriously the fact that there is an actual truth out there. And we all have an obligation to get to that truth. But part of that truth is foundationally ideas. The ideas still matter. And nobody wants to talk about them anymore. And that is to all of our detriment. When the president leaves and we're looking at 2024 and there's Pence and there's Nikki Haley and, and there's whoever else is out there. It'll be about the ideas, not just the personalities moving forward. Y'all, I I can't get over this David Gura guy. I mean, he actually, he is an anchor and reporter, not just on MSNBC, but NBC News. He was at Bloomberg TV. He was at NPR. And now he's declaring that the, if you call COVID-19, the coronavirus, the Wuhan virus, that it's racist. Except that MSNBC and NBC, they were calling it the Wuhan virus back in January. Does that mean they were racist back then? Does, does, does that mean they were racist? Or, or, or is it only racist now that the Chinese have decided that they don't like it? And 
we've got to kowtow to the Chinese government and not call it the Wuhan virus now that the Chinese have declared this. How many people will get killed because of wokeness? I mean, I, I, I say that somewhat in jest, but the you know the World Health Organization is refusing to call the, the coronavirus the Wuhan virus. They're, they're refusing to call it a pandemic. And it's because, according to sources within the World Health Organization, they don't want to anger the Chinese. <gasps> oh, heavens to Betsy. We, 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 can't, we can't call it the Wuhan virus because it's racist, and we can't call it a pandemic because we'll be angering the Chinese. It's so stupid. So, so, so stupid. And it makes people not take it seriously. And here's the thing. You need to take the virus seriously. You just don't need to take it that seriously. There, there is a fine line between overplaying it and underplaying it. And if you're on the right right now, your tendency is to underplay it. It's no big deal. No one's going to get it. If you're on the left, your tendency right now is to overplay it and say we're all going to die. And both sides are coming at it from their political perspective. There's actually reason to be concerned about it. There's actually reason to not go into large crowds if you can avoid it. There's actually reason to make sure you're doubling up on washing your hands. There's actually reason to, to not touch your face. I'm sorry, y'all. I got to tell you. Uh, in fact, I'm scratching my nose right now because I just said don't touch your face and when I say when I think about not touching my face guess what I do I touch my face I am running around like a meth head scratching my face right now because everybody's telling me not to touch my face I'm sorry you tell me not to do that I'm going to because my face is going to start itching speaking of by the way so the other day (laughs) When was it? When, when was it? It was, it, was, it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday of last week. I was on radio, and, and I had to go up to Athens to our flagship, WGAU. I, w- I was doing my evening show from up there. Abby, if you're listening, you're going to love this. Uh, Abby's the program director at WGAU. Um, so we're up there, and Philip is with me. Philip runs, runs the uh, resurgent website for me and does a lot of the digital stuff for me. And my wife, because I'm on air, she knows I'm on air, she texts Philip and she says, has he said something to make people upset? There are police outside our house. I was like, no, I haven't done anything. It's not my fault. Turns out the people just up the street from us were selling meth and weed and illegal guns out of their house. And there was a huge police raid. I mean, I can see their house from my house happening in my neighborhood. Someone running meth out of the out of this house. Good Lord, it happens everywhere. It is Eric Erickson here, the Eric Erickson Show. Welcome. Greetings. If you want to call in and have a chat, the phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Greg Bluestein is in Cobb County right now. Greg Bluestein is the political reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and they are having the, the Cobb Republicans among others, are doing an event uh, at which Nikki Haley is there for Kelly Leffler. She is endorsing Kelly Leffler and going to be on the campaign trail. Let me pull up Bluestein's Twitter account real quick um, so I can read it as opposed to conveying it to you in my synopsis. Nikki Haley brings out the crowd. There are more people than I've ever seen before at the Cobb County GOP awaiting her endorsement of Kelly Leffler. Uh, she is, uh, if you're if you just tuning in and you did not know, uh, Nikki Haley is endorsing Kelly Leffler. Uh, Kelly Leffler also went to Florida with President Trump. He introduced her as his special guest to his top donors down in Florida. Pretty big sign of where the party is lining up now, uh, leaving the, the Collins campaign a little bit perturbed. Also, this is happening now. Uh, John King, not the CNN uh, host, but the Georgia Insurance Commissioner, has announced a directive to waive barriers f- to care for COVID-19. Uh, this is the statement. Today, Georgia Insurance and Safety Fire Commissioner John King issued a directive to insurance companies across the state, encouraging them to take proactive steps to better provide access to care for their customers during the COVID-19 public health challenge. Now that there have been confirmed cases of coronavirus in Georgia, it is essential we're doing everything we can to remove any potential barriers to care for our citizens. The directive we issued this morning is meant to ensure that no Georgian is denied access to testing or treatment for this disease. 
The directive calls on insurers to waive cost sharing for in-network provider office, urgent care center, or emergency room visits when testing for COVID-19, particularly for those individuals with high deductible plans. It instructs insurers to verify their provider networks are adequate to handle a potential increase in volume of COVID-19 cases and calls on them to provide access to out-of-network providers at an in-network rate if they are not. Now, you should also know the governor is uh, calling a press conference at 4.15 today. Uh, There are rumors afoot uh, that we now have a a greater spread of the COVID-19 virus in the state of Georgia. Um, We don't really know for sure. It's just rumors are afoot. Man, I keep hearing rumors all over the place that that so-and-so and and -and so-and-so has talked to so-and-so and and that so-and-so has has people and -and so-and-so's people in those places are telling me that there's coronavirus in such and such a hospital and someone's in isolation, but such and such a doctor has gotten it and on and on it goes. Um, And it's all rumor mongering, people gossiping. Um, You know, this is one of the reasons gossip's a sin, people. Uh, Cut it out. We don't really know. What we do know is that there are 566 confirmed cases in the United States, and there have been 22 people thus far to die. All of the people who have died are 80 or older. Um, so there you have it. That's it. Um, I, here's Anthony Fauci and I'm going to move on. I want to talk about Joe Biden, but, uh, this is starting to, there are people out there and, you know, I'm, as I mentioned the first hour, you got to balance this out because there are people who are way overplaying it and there are people who are way underplaying it. And on the right, you've got, oh, you're not going to get it. It's just a cold. It's not going to kill you. And on the left, you've got, oh, everybody's going to die. Um, it's, there's actually a happy medium here of reasonable coverage that, You're probably not going to get it. If it gets into your community, a whole lot of people are going to get it. No one is going to die from it unless they're old, more likely than not, or if they have underlying conditions. Uh, There's no reason to stockpile. There's no reason to hoard. There's no reason to buy $1,000 worth of groceries you're eventually going to throw away. But be prepared. It is new, which means it is much more contagious. We know for certain it lasts on hard surfaces longer than the flu, which makes it easier to pick up. So just wash your hands. And there are signs that all of this coverage is actually working. I've mentioned this before. Let me mention it again. The rate of flu in this country right now should slightly be upticking as we head into March. It's actually dra- rapidly declining, and that suggests people are responding to the COVID-19 situation by washing their hands more, and that's keeping them from getting the flu. It's also keeping them from this. But, you know, life goes on. I was at church yesterday, and one person elbow bumped me. Everybody else, I was shaking hands. I was an usher at church yesterday, so I was passion- passing out the, the um, bulletin for church people were shaking my hands. We had a good time. We had a meal after church. My son joined the church. uh, And, and so we went to a meal after that on, on the grounds at church and people were going, life is, life is normal. I mean, it'll treat it like the flu, be cautious and just understand the elderly are much more susceptible to it. Um, But understand that there are reasonable concerns and the media is not doing this to hurt. Now there are certainly people in the media who are doing it to hurt the president, but come on now. Uh, Just, just, just calm down. Okay. I want to talk about Joe Biden because I, you know, I'm wondering if we're in a um, in a boy who cries wolf scenario. For those of you who don't remember, you should remember. But the fable was it an Aesop's fable? I can't remember if it's Aesop's or not. A boy is in the field tending the sheep for his father, and the boy in the morning becomes very bored. And he rushes to the town out of boredom to turn out some excitement. And he says, a wolf, a wolf, a wolf is coming. And the people of the town, they grab their pitchforks and they grab their guns. And they head off to the field to protect the boy's father's sheep. And there is no wolf. And the boy laughs. And the, and the, the town, they grumble and they go home. And as the sun rises high in the day... The boy, again bored, decides to do it again. And he rushes to the town screaming, There is a wolf! There is a wolf! There is a wolf! He's back! He's back! He really is back! And the neighbors rush off to the field to stop the wolf. And the boy falls out laughing. Laughing clearly has made it up. And the town is so alarmed and aggravated and mad and and angry with the boy. And they go home. 
And as the sun is going down, the heat of the day, the insects are buzzing. The boy looks on the horizon at the edge of the field, and there, there is the wolf. And the boy is terrified, and he runs to the town screaming, There is a wolf. There is a wolf. He's there. He's there. Please, someone help me. Please, someone help me. And the town has had enough of the boy, and they don't believe him. And so they do not come, and the wolf kills the sheep. Thus ends the reading of the fable. <laughs> um, let me let me talk to you about this. And you know, we could say this about the coronavirus. You've had Y two K. You've had um, you've had all sorts of hysteria over the years, and so now maybe people aren't uh, alarmed with that. But I want to talk about it from the standpoint of Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump, because for four years the media has been selling us hard on President Trump as mentally unfit for the job. I mean, the stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post, on CNN, on MSNBC, in your local newspaper, they're all about the president's gaffes, the president's missteps, the president uh, referring to Tim Cook as Tim Apple, um, and and the president uh, saying things that aren't true, the president not uh, the president having a love affair with lying, so to speak, to quote some members of the media, uh, things the president says they're just simply not true. The president gets details wrong. Is the president fit for his job? We've heard this for four years. Is the president mentally competent to be president of the United States? The things he says, they are not true. The president seems unengaged in the job. The president lacks intellectual curiosity. (coughs) The president screws up all these things. Is the president well? Is he mentally well? Is the president mentally fit? Can the president do the job? Is he going to screw up? And on and on it goes. And what I can tell you for certain is that the media has not engaged with this when it comes to Joe Biden. The media has largely excluded Joe Biden from any conversations about mental competence. And there is clearly something going on with Joe Biden at his age. I don't know if he has dementia or if it's old age. But just as the president does some very weird things and says some very out-of-place, odd things, the media is ignoring the same odd things, if not more odd things, that Joe Biden says. For example, in South Carolina, Joe Biden said he was running for the Senate instead of the presidency. Now, on the campaign trail, you're going to get states wrong. Everybody gets states wrong. You're flying from state to state. You can't remember which state you're in. It's hard to keep up. And, and But Joe Biden has done this repeatedly. He's just said some really weird things, some really off things. And, and let's not what, – what was the guy's name, the, 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 the swim? Um, I, I can't remember the guy's name. But, you know, he told the very weird story about his hairy legs in the pool and the kid hitting, hitting his hairy legs to see the, the hair fall flat and then float back up. It's just weird stuff. He can't remember what year it is. He can't remember what day it is. He can't remember what state it is. He can't remember who he's on stage with. He gets people mixed up. He creepily hugs people and sniffs their hair and does all sorts of things. There's clearly something there with Joe Biden. In the same way the Democrats say there's clearly something there with Donald Trump, there's clearly something there with Joe Biden. And what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we're going to highlight the president's uh, foibles when it comes to misstatements and missteps and on mental behavior, we should do the same with Joe Biden, except the media is not. The media for four years has fixated on all all these things with the president to the extent that it's in one ear out the other with a lot of people. A lot of people just don't care. They've kind of banked on it with Donald Trump. And here come these moderate voters thinking that Joe Biden is going to be their escape hatch from the age of Trump. They're going to go back to the normalcy of Barack Obama's administration. In fact, there's a report in Axios today, uh, the online uh, news outlet in D.C., that Joe Biden intends to signal normalcy. And one of the things Joe Biden intends to do is surround himself with people from the Obama administration, people who will, in fact, uh, convey a sense of normalcy. But a lot of these moderates haven't heard about Joe Biden's mental problems. The media has been so fixated on telling people uh, about Donald Trump's problems and foibles and missteps and odd statements, they haven't actually paid attention to the things that Joe Biden says. 
they haven't actually paid attention. In fact, we know that Joe Biden can be a gaffe machine, and it's one thing that worries the Democrats. Here's Helene Cooper. She was on, um, where was it, Meet the Press, talking to, to uh, Chuck Todd about this this weekend. It really seems as if, though, the everything uh, uh, provided uh, we don't have a major Biden gaffe in the next uh, couple of weeks. It's, it's, it, feels, it feels as if all the, the stacks are in his, his favor now because uh, keep in mind, last Tuesday we had only seen so many people had absentee voted or voted already or early voted uh, between South Carolina and Tuesday that you, I think we saw just the tip of the Biden wave and I think what you're going to see uh, this coming in a, in a couple of days and beyond that is a, just a wholesale shift and that, that would make me not want to want to be want to be Bernie Sanders. A a gaffe, a, a major Biden gaffe that see the Democrats know it's possible to have major Biden gaffes. And, and here's the thing. All of these moderates who have been looking for an escape hatch thinking, I can go with Joe Biden. He's not like, yeah, he's older than Donald Trump, but he's more stable. He'll have a more stable administration. Will he really if he's nuts? And not if he's nuts, if he's old, if he's got dementia, if there's something wrong with him. I Listen, the man is almost 80 years old. He's had brain hemorrhages in the past. Um, it, it is The media doesn't want to talk about it, though. They want to talk about President Trump. They don't want to talk about Joe Biden. And, and they don't want to talk about brain hemorrhages. They don't want to talk about his odd statements and behavior on the campaign trail. And so it's new for moderates. It, it, the, the media's been crying wolf about Donald Trump for four years. They've been highlighting all of the problems with Donald Trump. They've been highlighting his fitness for office or lack thereof. They've been highlighting his character or lack thereof. They've been highlighting his mental capacity or lack thereof. And they haven't done it for Joe Biden. When the Donald Trump campaign starts highlighting these things about Joe Biden, then the media does not reciprocate and the media does not engage or the media says, as some members of the media have been doing, say, oh, it's just stuttering. He's had a lifelong stuttering problem. You know, I stuttered when I was a kid. I had a terrible t- stuttering problem when I was a kid. In fact, when I get spun up on radio, sometimes you can hear me. I start stuttering. My my mouth and brain get out of sync. And that's somewhat normal, but also somewhat a product of when I was a kid and I stuttered a lot. I talked very fast and my brain moved very fast and I stuttered. And I've had to work on that over the years. And here, all of a sudden, I am on radio. And Joe Biden, supposedly, when he was a kid, had a stuttering problem. And the media has passed all this stuff off as a stuttering problem. But I'm sorry. When you're in South Carolina and you say you're in California, that's not a stuttering problem. When you're running for president and you say you're running for the Senate, that's not a stuttering problem. When you go off on these random tangents and totally forget where you are, that's not a stuttering problem. And so many people, if they're not plugged in to the campaign, they haven't paid attention. And in not paying attention, it's going to come as a surprise to them. They think they've got a way out. They think they've got an escape hatch from the Trump administration. They think they'll be safe with Joe Biden. And along comes the multi-million dollar Trump campaign ad by highlighting the fact that all the things you accuse Donald Trump of having mentally, Joe Biden actually has, that's going to have an impact. Remember, we're fighting over the swing states. And oh, by the way, there is polling out in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, the three must-win states of the Trump presidency. And Trump is ahead of Biden. Okay, (laughs) you want your cheery thought of the day? I don't know who this guy is, but a friend of mine who is uh, big into uh, tech and works out in Silicon Valley sent me this. It's making the rounds out there. Eliezer Yudkowsky. Let, let me see if I can Google who this person is. He's got a blue check mark on Twitter, so he must be somebody. <laughs> As my conscience yells back, you have a blue check mark and you're nobody. Uh, he is an, oh, he's an American AI researcher. And he writes about artificial intelligence. He's the co founder and research fellow of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, in Berkeley, California. So he is kind of a somebody, and he just put up this tweet. Prediction. In two months, California weather will turn hot and dry again, sparking wildfires. When PG&E turns off electricity at the height of the Great Plague, it will spark civic unrest. And when the unlit skies are ridden with fire, plague, and war, then comes the Bay Area earthquake. 
countdown to Armageddon. I keep looking into the eastern sky, waiting to see a guy on a horse coming out of the sky. But nope, Lord Jesus ain't coming yet. But my goodness gracious, um, it is fascinating to watch this taking shape globally. Uh, the, the the plague and war and, and random earthquakes and places that don't get earthquakes and suddenly renewed volcanoes that have been long dormant and stuff. You start you, when you, you hear the Bible talk about birth pangs, you start wondering, hmm, what's going on? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. OK, we got other stuff we should talk about. Uh, including Mick Mulvaney is out. Mark Meadows is in. Mick Mulvaney was out on a, a trip to Las Vegas with his, some, uh, it was basically a, a guy's only trip of family members to Las Vegas, and Mulvaney found out he was out of a job. Mark Meadows is coming in, and uh, he will be the chief of staff. Mick Mulvaney is being exiled to Northern Ireland, not a bad place to be exiled to, as the Northern Ire- Ireland envoy. A lot of people have been pushing to do that. And, you know, one of the, the aggravating things about this is a among some White House staff, there is contempt for Mark Meadows because he doesn't have a real college degree uh, from 30, 40 years ago. He, he, he doesn't have a real college degree. I think he had a degree, uh, like an associate degree in marketing or some such. The man has been a successful businessman for decades, gets elected to the United States Congress, becomes a highly successful congressman, and earns the trust of the President of the United States, is known for being willing to disrupt and block uh, the the acts of Republicans that get out of control. He has the President's ear. He cares deeply about debt and deficit, and there are people in the White House say, well, he doesn't have a real college degree. I can't believe the president would do this. He just wants a friend to be in the office with him. Disparaging Mark Meadows. I hope he goes in and finds out who these people are and fires them all. Uh, the the stunning level of arrogance from these people is, is just, it's it's appalling to me how arrogant some of these people are. And lastly, before, before we come, when we come back, there's a mind-blowing story about Google location services we need to get into. It is a non-political story, uh, but daylight saving time. I'm still getting emails from people from last week when I was talking about daylight saving time. People really, really upset about it. Some of them want to be on standard time. Some of them want to be on daylight saving time permanently. I just don't want the time to keep changing. Pick, pick, people, pick. And yet there are a lot of people who are really upset about um, about this. I, I, I just got to tell you, um, I'm I'm just I'm not a fan of the time change. I'm really not. Uh, I like it being later in the evening, but I would just like us to stop changing time and for Congress to get its act together on this. When we come back, though, are you being tracked? A Washington, D.C. area priest has coronavirus. He offered communion and shook hands with more than 500 worshipers last week. And on February 24th, all the worshipers who visited uh, Christ Church in Georgetown, an Episcopalian church, uh, must self-quarantine. The church has canceled services now for the first time since the 1800s. Uh, wow. Uh, gracious. Um Interesting, interesting situation as we see this uh, spreading. Now, I don't want to talk about coronavirus anymore. And I don't want to talk about politics anymore. To a degree, I'm sure there are political angles we can get here, but I'm actually really fascinated by this story. Uh, and I get asked about these all the time. You know, um, you can – so I'm on Spotify now. Spotify, for, for those of you older than me, Spotify is a digital music subscription service where you can listen to pretty much any song on the planet. It's like Apple Music. It uh, doesn't have the catalog that Apple Music has. It's not as well integrated into iPhones, but Spotify is very good. And if you ask Spotify to play the Eric Erickson show, well, by God, you'll get my show now. And you can access uh, radio on, on, for example, Google Home, or you can access it on your Amazon Echo, which is called Alexa. You can say, for example, uh, Alexa, turn on WGAU radio, and you'll hear me from my flagship station in, in Athens. Or, uh, or, or, hey, Google, 
turn on uh, WCHM radio in, in Clarksville, Georgia. You can hear me there or, or um, WRGA or WMAC in Macon or, or wherever. Uh, don't get your feelings hurt if I haven't given you a shout out on a radio, local radio station. You know what I'm talking about, though. You can do it on on, on Apple's products, too. You can say, hey, Siri, and, and do stuff. And, yes, I'm triggering, triggering your devices intentionally because it's annoying you, and it's not my intention, but it is to show you how ubiquitous it is now. Uh, and unless you have your devices changed to recognize just your your voice, you're going to have problems and, and people can get into those systems. And if you're using the Google devices or the Amazon devices, this is why I like Apple. Um, there is a big divide. And let me explain this before I get into this story. There is a huge divide in privacy between Google and Amazon and, and Apple. And the way to explain this, and it makes the people at Google and Amazon upset when you explain it this way, but it's true. Makes the people at Facebook mad when you explain it this way, too. But you are the product at Google and Amazon. You are the product. See, Amazon and Google make their money by selling stuff to you and actually by giving information to advertisers so in advertisers can sell stuff to you. There is this growing trend now where people are talking about stuff and then suddenly they see the ads pop up on their phones, particularly Android devices, and people are convinced that Facebook and Google and the like are listening to you. Well, they actually are tracking you, and Apple does it differently. Apple is deeply, deeply concerned about your privacy, and so Apple makes it very, very hard for these companies to track you, and occasionally they find that companies have been monkeying around in the code, and they they ban some programs. In fact, Apple for a while took Uber out of the Apple store because Uber was inappropriately tracking people, Uh, and this is why, by the way, if you have an iPhone, if if you have an Apple device, and you are constantly now getting these little pop-up screens saying, uh, this this app app uses Bluetooth, do you want it to use it? The reason that some apps are using Bluetooth on your iPhone and why you're getting notice is Apple has discovered that some apps actually use Bluetooth to trace you, to figure out where you're going, because your Bluetooth signal goes out to other Bluetooth devices, and they can be relayed to Google or to Amazon so that they know you're in a location. So, for example, you go to Store X in, in uh, let, let's say you, you go Tiger, Georgia, just on the top of my head. You, you go to a small store in Tiger, Georgia. And you go into a store, it's, it's a small clothing store, and there are devices in there, and your, your Bluetooth registers... You're using Google, and you've said, okay, Google can use Bluetooth, and go into the store, and, and someone's Android phone is in that store and registers that your iPhone is in that store, and it all goes back to Google that you've been there, and Google will start selling you stuff based on you having been there. It is very, very easy for advertisers, they're getting so much data from Google and Amazon and the like, to do this, it becomes problematic. And Amazon and Google listen to your conversations. If you have one of their devices, an Echo or a Google Home, they listen to your conversations because they're waiting for you to say Alexa or they're waiting for you to say, hey, Google, to trigger the devices. And and Apple for a while was doing this and then deleting the conversations, waiting for people to to trigger Siri. Uh, and, And Apple stopped. And Apple now makes a big thing about your privacy, that you're Location cannot be tracked. The way Apple does location tracking is they take segments of your route, they scramble the identity of the device that it's coming from and, and send it into a server and keep it for a limited amount of time. So it's almost impossible for the the, the police to find you. For example, um, if you're using messages on an Android device, it, your device messages are very, very easy to hack. If you're using messages on Apple, you know how you have blue bubbles and green bubbles? Your green bubbles in an Apple message mean that it's an unsecured service going to people who don't have an iPhone. If it's a blue message, it means it's going from Apple device to Apple device, and it's completely secure. You can send your password, you can send your credit card number, all that stuff with a blue bubble, and it's going to be super secure, and no one's going to get it unless they can hack in and get your backups from Apple, which is exceedingly difficult to do because it requires your physical phone to be able to do it. The location services for Amazon and Google are used to sell you information and not to Apple. That's what makes it different. And now we're, we're having trouble. Uh, this is from The Verge, a tech website. A Florida man who used a fitness app to track his bike rides found himself a suspect in a burglary 
when police used a geofence warrant to collect data from nearby devices, an NBC News investigation finds Zachary McCoy had never been in the home where the burglary occurred. But by leaving his location settings on for the RunKeeper app, he unwittingly provided information about his whereabouts to Google, which placed him at the scene of the crime. Since McCoy had biked past the house where the burglary took place three times on the alleged day of the alleged crime, part of his usual route through the neighborhood, he was deemed a suspect. NBC News says Google's legal investigations team contacted McCoy in January, notifying him that Gainesville Police in Gainesville, Florida, were demanding information from his Google account. He was eventually cleared as a suspect, but not before having to hire a lawyer to help him figure out exactly what data police were seeking. The geofence warrant, a type of search warrant, required Google to provide data from any devices it recorded near the scene of the burglary, including location. The data is usually drawn from Android location services. Collection can be turned off from the account's menu and settings. Law enforcement requests for geofence warrants have risen sharply in the past several years, NBC News notes, rising 1,500 percent from 2017 to 2018 and another 500 percent from 2018 to 2019. Last year, the New York Times highlighted the 2018 case of Jorge Molina accused in an Arizona homicide after police used a geofence warrant that suggested he was near the scene of the crime. The case against Molina eventually fell apart as new evidence came to light. Last month, Google announced it was putting new restrictions on which Android apps can track location in the background with all new Google Play apps that seek background access subject to a review process. But Google would not immediately respond for comment. Now, again, so with Google and Alexa for Amazon and even some of the Facebook stuff, your whole routes can be tracked and traced to your phone. This is another reason I have an Apple device. With the Apple device, uh, everything is scrambled so that it cannot be pinned to your particular device. Had this guy used an Apple device instead of an Android device and was still using RunKeeper Pro, uh, he could not have been pinned to the location as he could with an Android device. And that actually matters. It actually would make it more secure. And the police are not doing a great job of ferreting out information at this time. And in Google and Amazon make it very easy. This Again, I, I am a, an advocate for Apple. I'm an evangelist for Apple, and it has a lot to do with privacy and security. Um, Android devices are part of Google, and Google wants to sell your information to advertisers, and advertisers want to use your information, and if advertisers can get the information, the cops can get the information. This is why I have a real problem with backdoors. Um, Facebook wants to secure Facebook messages. Apple has secured messages. If it's blue message to blue mess, blue bubbles, Facebook has secured WhatsApp, and now Facebook wants to secure Facebook messages. And the media and the, the, the helpfully helping the governments of the world says, hey, this is bad. If Facebook secures these messages, then the, the government will not be able to figure out who's committing crimes, and they won't be able to snoop on people they think are committing crimes. And one of the things that uh, they bring up all the time is human trafficking, that, oh, my goodness, so many people use WhatsApp to engage in human trafficking. Well, guess what? WhatsApp is already secured. So it's not it, it's not something Facebook's going to retroactively degrade that service and and. Uh, my goodness, um, you can find them in other ways. I understand the fear factor. Like, for example, the San Bernardino shooter. Remember that years ago when Barack Obama was president, the terrorists shot up the place. And then there was the Orlando nightclub shooter as well. And I believe they were using Apple devices that are highly secure and the police couldn't get into them. The media, of course, peddles these as a fear tactic for for the governments of the world to try to get into these devices. But here's the thing. If you make a back door so that the police can get into your iPhone, that back door is not going to be exclusively used by police. It's going to be used by hackers as well. You cannot make a secure entry point for governments without also creating a secure entry point for hackers. Because if the government can get into your phone, a hacker can get into your phone. Someone with malicious intent can get into your phone. 
And you can say all you want that, well, if, if you're not a criminal, you have nothing to hide. Except here's a man in Florida who had to go hire a lawyer because his device gave off his location in an unsecured way that Google was able to get it and then send it to the government. And in getting it and sending it to the government, uh, this man had to hire a lawyer because he became a suspect in a burglary, and that's not right. It's just not right that that happened to this guy. He became a suspect solely because on a regular basis he was riding his bike past this house that happened to get burglarized. And had he used an Apple device that was secure, uh, this wouldn't have happened to him. You can't give back doors to the government into your devices and into your private chats. And I know it sounds good, and, and this is where I come down with the civil libertarians and, and against a lot of my friends who are desperate for the back door. They are desperate in the belief that the terrorists are going to use their phones and they're going to coordinate a, another 9-11 and the government will never be able to find out because it will be untraceable on phones, except there are other patterns and practices. The world does not just exist on your phone. The world also exists in the real world. And so the governments, instead of going after people's digital lives, needs to redouble efforts in the real world to do things. There will always be bad people online doing things, but the offline goes to off uh, go, the online goes to offline. So for example, the dark web. Have you heard about the dark web? I've actually explored the dark web. I got curious about the dark web a, a while back. You can buy a web you can buy a web browser and you can get on the dark web. And I couldn't make heads or tails of anything by the way. There there's a there's a Wikipedia you, you can find on the dark web. You know what Wikipedia is? It's an online encyclopedia. Well, they have one on the dark web and you can start finding all sorts of websites on the dark web where you can buy drugs and guns and and commission killers, hitmen and and all sorts. You can do all sorts of stuff on the dark web. It, it's way overinflated. You can't get to it with your standard browser on the internet. That's the thing people don't understand. You can't go to Chrome or Safari or Internet Explorer or Firefox and get into the dark web. You have to buy a particular, or get, it's free, a particular browser, and away you can go. And you can buy drugs and sell drugs and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and, and there was this great article in Wired Magazine that got me curious, but you can't make heads or tails of it. It's like the old days of DOS where everything is text-based. Uh, and, and I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole too far because there are hackers. When you get into this, they can hack into your computer. And I just wanted to see, is this thing real? And it is. Um, and you can find all sorts of nefarious things if you know where to look. And you have all these things, oh, the dark web, the dark web. But it's actually a tiny fraction of what goes on on the Internet. And the governments of the world routinely have invaded the dark web and they round people up. There was this place called, I think it was Pirate something, I can't remember, but essentially it was an online drug portal, and it was run by a guy in San Francisco, and you could get on there and buy and sell drugs, any drug. I mean, you, you named the drug, you could do it. It wasn't just people buying weed. It was, I mean, uh, cocaine and methamphetamine and uh, crack and you name it. And people, they would package it up in vacuum-sealed containers so drug-sniffing dogs couldn't figure it out and put it in packages that obfuscated what was in the x-ray, and away you go. And, and people were using Bitcoin and buying drugs. Really, I need to find that story from Wired and explain it to you. But the police still found out about it. They were still able to get in there, and they were still able to arrest the people. And the whole place shut down. And there's a new place, and then that place gets shut down, and a new place, and that place is probably going to be shut down. Your offline, tra your online transactions to buy drugs or or do something nefarious. Eventually, the rubber meets the road, and that online purchase becomes offline when they send drugs to your house, and the police find out about it. Or when you're online and doing secure messages, trying to, to buy and sell people and engage in human trafficking or, or who knows what. Eventually, that becomes an offline transaction, and the police should redouble their efforts there and stop trying to read your text messages on your phones. There are plenty of other places to do it. And we should all be concerned from a civil liberty standpoint that we have a situation now in this country where the police are rounding people up based on geofencing warrants that say, huh, this person went past that house three times. They must be a suspect as opposed to this guy's a jogger. He runs past the house every day. I'm starting to think I may just need to bunker down. Just got this this note from my office. We've placed Clorox wipes in each of the, the on-air studios. 
please make sure you take time at the end of your shift to wipe down countertops, computer mouse, phone handset, and any other surfaces you may have touched during your shift. We want to make sure we're being proactive and keeping the studio disinfected before someone is sick. When you run out of wipes, we have more. Um, And on a related note, if you're feeling sick, don't come into the office. Uh, beginning to show signs of a fever, cough, congestion, etc., could mean you're coming down with something. There's no honor in dragging yourself into work and getting everyone else. Thank you. Thank you for saying this. You, you know, I, I realize I, I myself um, am, am a work addict. I, I love my, my this job. Y'all, I get to come in here three hours a day and then do two more hours of radio every day, and I get to talk about what I want to talk about, and you can call in and interact with me. Uh, e- e- this this is not a job. This is just, I mean, I, I listen, I know this isn't a job because if none of you lived, if the coronavirus wiped out the entire world except for me, I would still come get behind this microphone every day and do this show. And that is how much I love doing it. Uh, it is a passion more than it is a job. Um, but I don't understand this need for, oh, I'm sick. I'm going to go to the office. Like, I don't understand people who their kids are sick and they send them to school. And it, it is a pet peeve of mine, particularly with my kids uh, who have been susceptible. And in fact, my kid was home three days last week, was home the whole week before uh, just being was sick, got a virus, and it turned into a bad sinus infection. And the kids stayed home. And I, there are people I know who will send their kids. And I realize that the parents are thinking, I got to go to work. I can't miss work. And so school becomes babysitter for a kid who's got a stomach bug and is throwing up in school. And that's a real problem with people spreading germs. At the same time, I do think we need to be mindful of something. Uh, in the media, there is a great um, belief now that we can all just stay home and we'll all be telecommuting. A plumber cannot telecommute. A hairstylist cannot telecommute. An electrician cannot telecommute. There are real jobs in the real world where people actually have to show up. They can't telecommute. And we all need to be mindful of those people, and some of whom may very well fall on hard times as everyone decides to self-quarantine themselves and shut themselves off from the world. It's going to be a problem for those people. And again, this is one of those areas where I think the church has an opportunity to stand up. Seriously. Um, there, there was a great thread on Twitter earlier that in the, the early days of Christianity and the Roman Empire, it was the Christians who were going and taking care of the, the pagan Roman citizens who were sick from the various plagues that were wiping out the empire. It was the Christians who practiced cleanliness, uh, who were going out and taking care of people, making sure there were meals delivered, not just to other Christians, but to people in their community who were sick. And so many people want to behave worldly and just like the world. And this, frankly, is a time for the church to stand up again and not just preach, but actually demonstrate um, that God's with them and they're going to do what they can to take care of other people in the world and, and make the world a better place. It is the perfect opportunity for the church to stand up, uh, particularly as we see time and time again these days, the government of the United States and elsewhere are collapsing uh, under the strain of this. And, and this is not a political point. Our government is not doing the best job it can. We heard Dr. Anthony Fauci this morning, and I played the clip, uh, where the government originally messed up the coronavirus test, and then they messed up the the dynamics of who could actually um, who could actually get the test. And now, of course, we got more people trying to get the test, and local community uh, health centers are able to get the test, but it was all a me- mess up at first. In Italy, they've had all sorts of government incompetence. In, in Japan, they've had government incompetence. In China, good Lord, have they had government competence. Uh, individuals in local communities with local churches and nonprofits are going to be far more competent at this stuff, and it probably is time for you, if you go to church or you're engaged in a nonprofit in your community, to sit down and say, okay, if this thing spreads, what can we as a nonprofit, what can we as a church do to help people who can't get into their houses? Can we deliver meals to people in, in increasingly isolated communities who f- less and less know their neighbors? Can we in some way engage with them and help them? Uh, and I hope that's something people will consider. What can your church do to help your community as, as people start to get nervous about this? Uh, it, it's not just preaching the word, it's living the word out in your local community, but it's not just churches either. It's your, it's your local Salvation Army, your local Red Cross, your local other nonprofit. What are you going to do to help your local community as people start getting sick if they do get sick? Don't panic, but be prepared.